<laughs> and away we go. <laughs> And now, the moment you've all been waiting for, the one, the only, the Bradley Hall. Oh my gosh. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I want to welcome you to today's edition of the Bradley Hall Show. I am your host, the Bradley Hall. I am proud to announce that today's episode, as well as every episode this month during NPE Awareness Month, is brought to you in partnership between the Bradley Hall Show and the NPE Friends Fellowship. You can find out more information at npefellowship.org. Hi, as you've guessed it by now, I am the Bradley Hall. I wanted you to know that I am a certified trauma recovery coach and a certified mindfulness instructor and a certified holistic life coach. Now, what this means is that I am a trauma informed holistic life coach with a focus on awareness, which is the first step to any type of personal growth. Let my 30 years of coaching and my experience overcoming trauma work for you. To work with me, go to my website, thebradleyhall.com. Look for the coaching tab in the upper right-hand corner. You can choose holistic life coaching or trauma recovery coaching. Anyone who ever accomplished anything had a great coach or a great mentor. You should too. You're worth it. Contact me now. Hi, and welcome back to another episode of The Bradley Hall Show. I am your host, The Bradley Hall. My guest today doesn't need much of an introduction in the NPE community. She is the founder of the NPE Friends Fellowship. And after her own emotional NPE revelation in 2017, she was driven to create an emotional support group on Facebook. And the rapid growth of this online community inspired the birth of a non-for-profit organization called the NPE Friends Fellowship. Since 2018, she has appeared on national and international networks, including ABC, NBC, Fox, BBC, and along with me, CBS, as well as numerous publications worldwide sharing her MP story and raising awareness for the NPE community. Please welcome my friend, Catherine St. Clair. Um, so today is your three-year anniversary uh, to discovering that you're an NPE. Yep. Three years ago today, the floor fell out from under my feet. Well, um, first of all, I want, I, I want to tell you that I'm honored that I get to celebrate that with you in this fashion. It's kind of <laughs> ironic. <laughs> yeah, it is. I didn't realize when we scheduled this that until this morning, that, oh my gosh, this is the day. So yeah. it's pretty interesting. Yeah, it is interesting. And we're doing this um, because uh, June, we've, we've, Determined that June is uh, NPE Awareness Month that coincides with uh, your founding of the uh, NPE Fellowship uh, in June, correct? Yes, actually, uh, June June twenty seventh is the day that the DNA NPE Friends Group was created. The fellowship came after. Okay. Um, but the fellowship actually came about a year after, so it was about I think it was around June of the okay. of twenty eighteen that we created the fellowship. Okay. Okay. Great. And I have, um, I, I am putting together a string of these, uh, around, uh, the NP theme and for, the, for the month. Um, I know that, uh, you and I are going to have this discussion today and we're going to release it month. Um, I, I just, I just spoke with Carrie the other day. Um, Paulette has, um, two parts. We talked a little more professionally about trauma and then she talked about her, um, NP journey. So I want to, I want to release these in, in June and uh, I'm going to advertise them so we can promote, promote the month and see if we can't recruit some more members and in, into the group, uh, and get the word out a little bit. So I, I'm grateful that you're, you're here sharing this experience with me today. So well, I'm thankful 
the opportunity to get to share it too. Thank you, Brad. Yeah. Yeah. You're welcome. You're absolutely welcome. Uh, telling our story is part of it, right? Absolutely. It's part of our healing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. So today is your three year anniversary. And you, I think you started off by saying that uh, when the bottom fell out, you want to expand on that a little bit? Well, um, without spending a lot of time talking about my story, I just want to kind of skim over it. Um, my, I'm the youngest of five kids that were uh, born to my parents. And my parents were married 51 years, and very conservative Christian family in Arkansas. And I was their youngest. And then a few years later, when I was a they became foster parents and took in foster children. And one of the foster children they ended up adopting. So I'm number five of six kids now. Um, and for my birthday, on my 55th birthday, I think it was, in 2016, uh, my siblings all got together and chipped in and bought me a DNA test because they knew I was a family genealogist and I would love to be able to confirm all of the uh, stories of the family, of where our family came from, confirm the ethnicities and all of that. Um, I was real excited about it. I couldn't wait to get the test results back. And I got them back, but I didn't really see anything that jumped out at me other than the fact that all these people that I matched, the person at the top of the list was an unfamiliar name and they were under the category of first cousin to close relative. Um, and I, I thought, well, this must just be somebody that's maybe one of my first cousin's children. And I've got like 20 something first cousins. So I figured, you know, I don't know all of their kids' names. It's probably one of them. And I didn't think anything more about it until um, May 17th of 2017, when I got a notification on my phone that my oldest brother had taken the test and that we matched. Ancestry sent me a, a notification. And so before I even opened it up, I sent him a text and said, hey, I just got a notification that you took the test and we matched. And he responded back and said, I didn't even know the results were back. I said, well, I just got a notification. So then I uh, finished that chat and went into my account. And sure enough, among all my relatives, there's his name. But he was listed as the second person I shared the most DNA with. And this first name, first person who I assumed was one of my first cousin's kids, she was still at the top. And it that was my first sign that something was not right because it didn't make sense to me how my brother, who's the closest relative I have, how could he be somebody I shared less DNA with than a total stranger? It didn't make sense. Um, I did more digging. I contacted the uh, testing company to find out if I could put some sort of a note on the relationship so I could confirm to anybody looking at the relationship between my brother and I, I could confirm to them, yes, Ancestry got this right. This is my full brother. And the woman on the other end of this, it was a chat I did online. Uh, the woman on the other end of the chat knew immediately what she was looking at and very gently walked me through and gave me a crash course on centimorgans and how we share centimorgans with our relatives. And the centimorgan is the lab value. And that this many centimorgans uh, is the range for a half sibling and this many is the range for a full sibling. And the whole time she's saying this to me, I'm going, that's not even what I ask her. Why is she trying to tell me about half siblings and full siblings? That's not what I ask. I don't understand. And then she pointed me to my brother's profile and said, click on the little icon by his name. It'll, it will tell you how many centimorgans you share. She had said that a half sibling shares on average about 1800. And when I clicked on that little icon, it said 1843. And the world stopped spinning at that moment. So you, at, at that, I mean, you figured it out immediately. I mean, you knew immediately. When she said, when she had just got through telling me a half sibling shares on average yeah. 1800 and the full sibling shares on average 2600 and I clicked on my brother's name and it said 1843 that number is burned in my brain forever now. And I yeah. realized at that moment. Oh my God. And even then the denial part of me kicked in and I thought I typed to her. It says 1843 expecting truly expecting her to come back and go oh but the exception to that rule is this to explain yeah. it away and she didn't she just said that means he's your half brother yeah so that's, um, that, that, that's why that's why i phrased the question the way i did uh it, it's a common theme as you well know that we 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 humans have the innate ability to see what we want to see and even sometimes when the proof is right in front of us it's difficult because it doesn't line up with the way we want to see it. That, that's a hard realization as we get older to realize that we, 
that, that our perception is, is that powerful. And that, that's why I asked that because I knew it probably at some level, even though it made sense on one hand, it didn't jive with the way you expected it to go. So, um, Right. I've yeah. said in the past, my head could accept it because I have a respect for science, but my heart had a real hard time absorbing yeah, it. I'm sure. Um, so I, uh, I ended the chat quickly, thanked her for her help, tried to go back to the business of work. It was right at noon, picked up a file on my desk and looked at it. And I just stared at it blankly and thought, I can't work. I can't focus on any of this now. And something inside me said, you need to go home. And I picked up my purse and I stood up. And the next thing I remember was standing in my living room. I don't remember walking out of my office. I don't remember getting on the elevator, getting in my car, driving. I don't, but I just remember standing in my office with my purse on my arm. And the next thing I remember was standing in my living room with my purse on my arm right after I walked in the door. And um, my little sister has a nurse that takes care of her at my home. And she saw me walk in the door and she was thinking, this is not typical. Catherine doesn't come home this time of day. So she walked into the living room and she saw the look on my face and I could tell by the look on her face, she looked terrified and she said, what's wrong? And I just collapsed. I, I just collapsed. I was, I was a mess. It was, a, yeah. it was a bad. Now, one of the common themes that, that, that we hear um, sometimes uh, is that, you know, for example, I, I knew I had always suspected at some level. I, I mean, I didn't, I, I, I can't say that I knew that that would be incorrect representation of that. But deep down, I realized once I found out that I had always known, but you didn't have that, did you? No, there was never any hint, never any sign. In fact, of the five siblings I grew up with, this running joke in our family was that our middle brother, Marty, was the milkman's son because the two older kids had blonde hair and blue eyes and fair skin. The two younger kids, me and my brother, were blonde haired. I have hazel, kind of a hazel gold tone eyes. My brother had uh, green eyes, um, but my middle brother, Marty, is dusky skin, dark curly hair, um, and, and the joke was the milkman was a Mexican because Marty could pass as, as Hispanic. Um, so that was always the running joke, and when this happened to me, in the past three years, he has brought it up several times and said, I'm still in shock that it wasn't me. I really thought it was going to be me. Yeah. I'm shocked, and I I said, Marty, I would have thought it was you too if it was, if it was anybody. Yeah. Never me. Yeah. yeah, there were no signs, no hints, no suspicion, nothing. And my, my biological father and his family's names were never mentioned in my home. I had never heard of him before. Okay. Okay. So, what has the biggest challenge been for you in, in, in this discovery? Um, that's a good question. I've thought about that a lot the past couple of days. There's been a lot of challenges, obviously. Um, I think that for me, what sets me apart from most NPEs I've, I've met in the past three years is that meeting my, making contact and meeting my new biological family came easier than most. Uh, the, that same day, I reached out to this person I shared DNA with, and she responded immediately and was extremely welcoming and loving and supportive of me and has been ever since. She's my half-sister. Um, <clears throat> she then introduced me to another half sister who's also equally enthusiastic to be a part of my life. And I'm very proud to consider them both my sisters. What surprised me, the biggest challenge I think I've had is my family of origin, the family I grew up with. Um, they're struggling. They're having a really hard time with this. Um, it's, it, it's, I think it has definitely affected my relationship with them and not in a good way. It's, it's kind of sad. And I'm hoping that someday it will get better. It's been three years, but I think that they would have much rather that I'd remain silent and not revealed this to anyone. I think that they are wrapped up in the embarrassment and they are self-conscious of the judgment that's being passed on my mother now, because I have been so vocal and so open and public about it. Um, and I don't think they can get past that. They can't let go of that long enough to see that what matters is that I, this was affecting me and my origins and who I am down to my core. And that's what should matter more than puritanical judgmental embarrassment. 
um, of, a, of a person who's deceased. I think that that's important to, to note too. I'll be honest with you, if my mother were still alive, would I have been this, this uh, open, this public? Probably not. Yeah. Um, I love my mother very much and I'm very proud of her and I do not pass critical judgment on her on what happened because I wasn't there when it, I, I don't know what she went through right. um, and it's not my place to judge. And I think that that's where my big goal is with being so public is that I'm hoping that I can help, help the public change the way they think about family secrets, change the way they think about judging people and the choices that they made, whether they were right or wrong or good or bad. Um, you know, <clears throat> we, none of us make all the right choices. We all make some bonerhead decisions on different things. Um, <clears throat> but it's not our place to judge what other people go through. We don't know what it was like in that era. We don't know what it was like for women in that era. We, we, we can kind of uh, imagine what it's like, but we didn't live it. So I just think it's, uh, that's, that's the biggest challenge for me, I think, is just trying to help uh, everyone understand that they need to set aside judgmental attitudes towards other people and the choices they made. And I think that would make a big difference with my family of origin too, if they would be able to get, get to that point. Yeah. Yeah. I, there, there's, there's two points really that, that come to mind as you're discussing that. And um, the, the first one is, is that I, <laughs> I'm, I agree with you and almost everyone I've talked to agrees with you that holding people accountable for what happened um, is, is, is not relevant. It, it doesn't really play factor into what's really important in this situation. Right. And I, and my, my mother is still living and my mother thinks that I do hold judgment against her because she's held that, that she's held that judgment inside her for 47 years with no outlet and then when it comes back around she's projecting that internal judgment on me i couldn't give a shit less what happened 47 years ago like you said i wasn't there lord it's knows hard. i made my, my own mistakes and and and, and i i mean i i've made i've made enough to last a lifetime for anybody so that and everyone and again not only you but everyone else i talked to said that that really was isn't at the forefront uh, of what this is that that judgment doesn't count I, I think for some people it does um but the starting point for us i think is that if if it didn't happen you and i wouldn't be here right and i have to start from there there is no i've heard people say i wish my mother wouldn't have had an affair uh because I, you don't you don't get that choice if your mother doesn't have an affair you're not you, and, and then you're not the person that your birth certificate father and her would have conceived. It'd have been something, someone completely different. So yeah. for me, that's a starting point that if it hadn't happened, I, I wouldn't be here. And there's a reason I'm here. So that's what we're going to go with. The second thing, and, and Dr. Paulette Bethel and I talked about this uh, a lot and Carrie and I actually talked about this the other day is the impact this has on everyone is often overlooked that, our identity is completely right. destroyed. It's just bottomed out. But also my, my sisters now have to grapple with the fact they're my half sisters. And people right. don't think that matters, but it does. It does, it does a, a psychological number, which I think is what you were talking about, that your family's having a real hard time struggling, you know, and the perception yeah. they had of your mother and, and all the things that they had neatly packed into what they thought their life was suddenly is distorted and shattered. And that's, that's hard for all of us. Uh, that's hard for all of us. Do you yeah, agree? I agree. I think it's, I completely 100% agree with everything you're saying. Um, I think that for people like your mom, they have been so brainwashed and drilled into their brain and conditioned that judgment has to be a part of your life is just like breathing is. And it's hard for them to take a step back and realize that judgment is a man-made emotion. It's, it's not something that should happen naturally, but it does now because we've been conditioned from childhood that these judgments need to be in place and that they are very valid. 
And it's only now, I think, with this DNA era that we're able to take a step back and go, okay, let's reevaluate. Why do we judge so much? What is it that makes this such an important element of our day-to-day life? And is it healthy? No, it's not. Judgment is toxic. Um, so I, I think it's sad because for our, the older generations, it's even harder for them to let go of conditioning that has been drilled in their heads for 60, 70 years yeah. and, and long. Um, so, you know, my heart goes out to your mom because I know she's struggling. And I also know that, and we've seen this Bradley with our group, haven't we? That people typically initially do not handle shocking information with grace. No. And maybe they fall all over themselves and they make a big hot mess of it in the beginning, but eventually they can come around to making peace and healing their family. I, I've, I've used this analogy many times that in a situation with an NPE, when they reach out to the biological father who never knew they existed, for example, um, everybody's just torn up. Everyone's all upset. The biological fa- father's uh, wife and kids are all upset. Everyone's all t- in a turmoil and they slam the door in her face and say, I don't want anything to do with you and never contact us again. Or they send a letter from an attorney saying, you know, cease and, des- cease and desist or whatever. But then some time gets goes by and they calm down and they realize this is our new reality. It's not going away. And then they start losing some of that fear that caused them to react the way they did, because that's what it's all based in is fear. And then eventually they can salvage and have a good relationship. I liken it to a 16 year old girl coming home and announcing she's pregnant and the family goes nuts and they scream and yell and they call her terrible names and she's crumbled on the floor boohooing and you just think there's no way this family's coming back from this this just caused so much trauma and scarring for this young girl um this is severe damage but then nine months later they're all hugging each other and kissing and laughing and passing out cigars and balloons and so happy and falling in love with this new life in their in their in their life because they've had eight or nine months to adapt to the idea there's going to be this person in our life and they're going to be part of our life for the rest of our lives. So they've had this time to adjust to that. And then they're able to accept that new person. I I think it's a lot the same way. There's a lot of um, more often than not, people do not handle this surprise information with grace. And I think that's one of the messages I'd like to get out to anybody who's making this discovery is that no matter how rocky it might be in the beginning of this discovery, engaging with family, old family and new family, just know that this is just one chapter in your life. It's not the end. Uh, There's going to be more to this story and people just need time to adjust to their new reality, to accept that this is the way it's going to be now. And they just need time and you've got to give them that. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with you. And it's a great point that people don't handle shocking news gracefully. I think it's a, it's, it's the human reaction to, to defend yourself it's a whole fight uh or flight thing you want you you either want to take it head on or you want to run from it and as the dust settles we get it you know we get our, our wits about us and and, and a great, excellent point i agree with you so this leads me to the question if you had to do this all over again would you, would you knowing what you know now i absolutely would i absolutely would i would too. Um, i feel like my life has more clarity now than it ever has um, I love movies and I, I use movies a lot as, as uh, uh, learning tools. I liken it to the first scene of the movie, The Matrix, where Keanu Reeves' character is living what looks like a normal mundane life, going through the motions of, of you know, a routine day. And then suddenly and abruptly, the viewer of this movie is shocked because that image of this man just disappeared and now he's laying on a table with all these wires and leads coming out of him and he's waking up and they're saying we've got to go and he's realizing that all of that was just an an illusion it was just a dream and what he was waking up for from this is my real life that's how it felt for me on may 17th 2017 it's like i crossed over this veil into what reality is and i'm looking back at my life for the past 56 years and i'm realizing that was an illusion this is real So as shocking and as upsetting as it is, I know who I am now. And that matters more to me than anything. So yes, I would rather live a difficult truth than a comfortable lie. I don't want to live in an illusion. I have more peace of mind now because I know that I can rebuild my life 
even though I felt like I was shattered that day, I have picked up those pieces and rebuilt myself into something that I'm very proud of. And, um, and yes, there's still a lot of elements from my past that's still a part of me, but I'd like to think that um, I'm trying to turn something that was devastating to me into something beautiful. And I'm kind of proud of myself. I feel like I'm doing that. Yeah, that's that's awesome. I couldn't have said it better uh, myself. You have heard me say that. So you know that I, I agree completely with everything you just said. Um, I, I, I'm right there with you. I'd rather live a difficult truth than, than a comfortable lie myself. I say all the time, I, if I can deal with anything as long as I know what I'm dealing with. And this, this falls into that category for me, for sure. So, all right. So what do you think is the most important thing that you've, you've learned through all this? And I'm sure there are many lessons I know, you know, it's altered your life in many ways, but what do you think is the most important? That judgment has no place in our lives. Um, I think that the majority of the problems that we have is based on um, ignorance, fear, and judgment, and they're all tangled up together. And educating ourselves and learning as much as we can is going to eliminate, it's going to armor us. So we, the armor of education and knowledge um, does more to protect us from the things that we would normally be fearful of. Fear is based out of ignorance. Um, and the fact that we were ignorant to who we were is one of the reasons why it was so devastating for us. So we want to eliminate fear. And the best way to do that is through education. So um, I think that that's one of the most important things that I'm taking from this is that <clears throat> we all need to always want to better ourselves and to learn more about who we are and learn more about what we can do to heal our families. And in doing so, we're not just healing ourselves and our families, we're helping other people who are within earshot of us or are rubbing elbows with us at work. And they're seeing this metamorphosis that we're going through and they're thinking, I want to be like that. I want to know more. You know, I admire her because she is reading everything she can read about this subject matter and she is taking it and turning it into something good. Um, so I think education is a really important part of, of what everybody needs to eliminate fear, judgment, uh, the self torment that we put ourselves through. Um, we just need to be constantly looking for ways to better ourselves. Yeah. Um, I, I, again, I mean, I couldn't have said it better. I, I agree with you completely. Um, <clears throat> jumping ahead a little bit uh, of what I wanted to talk about, that, that kind of takes us into the trauma recovery coaching, which, uh, you know, my listeners know that I'm a trauma recovery coach. And we I've talked about it with, with Dr. Paulette Bethel, that she's the one that urged me to get into it. Um, but the, there's something special on board for uh, for the MPE friends, for the fellowship. And, and uh, do you want to share a little bit of that? Um, yes, the fellowship has partnered with the International Association of Trauma Recovery Coaching, uh, the program that we are using to be certified by and Paulette Bethel has been certified by and that I am also in the process of being certified by. Um, we have found that there's a real serious need in the mental health community for proper training for NPE trauma. And uh, we have partnered with this organization to provide a trauma recovery uh, coaching program that specializes in NPE trauma. Uh, we hope to have it completely rolled out by the end of this year and uh, people who will receive that training will be uh, NPE-TRC uh, after their name, which signifies that they are trauma recovery coaches that are specializing in NPE trauma. Um, I think this is a really important uh, tool that is needed in the uh, mental health community. One thing I've learned is that there are a lot of people who are already much further advanced in the mental health training uh, as uh, psychiatrists, psychologists, um, family therapists, family counselors, who are eager to be involved in this training so that they can help people in our community. So uh, the fellowship is very excited about this. We are working very closely with the people who, are, uh, who have put together this program and uh, making sure that all the important elements are touched on and that, uh, and that it is a 
program that is focused on healing families. It's very important to us that we not only, it's important to us that we not only help the NPE find their peace again, which is the main goal, but it's more than that. If they can't find their peace completely unless they also are able to uh, give that same amount of support to the people who are impacted by their NPE discovery, their siblings, their parents, their children, their cousins, their coworkers, whoever wants to learn more about what they can do to, uh, to help a family that's going through this. Um, I'm just very excited and very proud of this program. I think it's a, a really important step towards uh, recognizing a very uh, valid trauma that has gone ignored for many, many, many years. Yeah, and I, the reason the reason I, I, I skipped ahead uh, was to, to come back to that fact that uh, this this is a traumatic event. I, I, I think, you know, when I first dis- discovered this, I, I have a, a friend, a very a very good friend, uh, you know, he, I, I can, I can count on him for anything. The first thing he said to me, well, he said, well, your dad is still your dad. So I don't understand what the big deal is, you know? And, mm-hmm. and I say that because he can't, he can, you know, he, he's outside. He can't comprehend what I'm going through. Um, right. But we, we know we now have a community of 7,000 people. This is, this is very real. This is very traumatic. It is a, is a negative I shouldn't say it's a negative defining moment because defining moments become what we make them ultimately. But the impact of this is immediately traumatic. Yes. And, um, and I think, I mean, we really need people to understand that. And, and, and I, I, from a basis that even new people coming into the group or whoever, if someone's listening who isn't part of the group or someone's listening who knows someone who's going through this to help them better understand that, it's a normal response to an abnormal situation that whatever you're feeling is validated because of the, the, the unnavigated terrain that you find yourself, uh, you find yourself in. And that's why the support with the group, uh, with the, the MPE friends is so important. And the trauma uh, recovery coaching is going to be so important for the, the, this, uh, for the MPEs. I think it's amazing that that you're doing this, uh, and I'm 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 excited to be a part of it. But more than that, I just want people to know that it's okay that you're dealing with this the way you're dealing with it to seek out other people. And I, and right. I think most of the people in the group have found. I know for me, when I came into the group, um, it had, it had been I, I it's all a blur. It could have been three months or three days. I don't know how long it had been. But my wife found a small blurb in the newspaper. I wish I would have kept it uh, for you, but, um, and she said, maybe you should check this out. And I was sitting on the couch and I said, okay. And uh, once I got into the group, there's a, you know, there's a process, a vetting process to get in for obvious reasons. Once I got in, I just, I think at that time <laughs> there were 320 people in the group or something. I, I don't know. And we're uh, and we're now what? 7,200? Almost 7,300. Yeah. That's amazing. Uh, it's amazing. And uh, I, I, I'm coming up on my, it's my two year anniversary. I don't know. Time's getting away from me, but I immediately found I, I was all alone. I was isolated. I thought I was the only person in the world who had just discovered this whole thing. And I came into a group where there was automatically at that time, I was like, wow, there are 300 people in here that are going through the same thing. And now it's, wow, there are 7,300 people in here that are going through the same thing. And that in itself was unbelievably therapeutic. I didn't yes. know any of the people, but I felt supported because we were all in the same in the same boat. It validates us. When you find out that there are other people who are normal people who have normal jobs and normal responsibilities, and they are not lunatics and they are not uh, you know, the, the scrunge of society or whatever. And it, these are people you pass in the grocery store or at church. And then you realize I'm not crazy. I'm not a freak. I'm just as normal as everybody else. And it's happening in all these other families too. So it, it's a huge comforting validation. I, I yeah. find that too. Every time I go, it takes my breath away when I look at the numbers. Yeah. Oh yeah. And I you know, still love reading people's. Go ahead. 
I was just going to say, you made me think of something when you were talking just a minute ago that I wanted to share. <clears throat> Our group had only been in existence maybe a month or less. We didn't have very many members at that time. Maybe, I don't know, a couple hundred, maybe a hundred. Um, I remember one day one of the members posted one question and the question was, is it okay to be angry? And I read that and I just, I'm, I don't cry easily, but when I saw that question, I just burst into tears when I saw it because I thought, oh my gosh, we don't even know if it's okay for us to feel the emotions we're That's feeling. Right. We're, That's right. That's right. It's okay for us to feel the way we're feeling. There's and, no playbook. Part. There's no playbook. Right. It, there's nothing to compare it to. There's no, yeah. no other thing in our childhood, you know, oh yeah, I remember somebody somebody else that went through that. Like, for example, when I said that about a teenage girl being pregnant, that may be traumatic and upsetting for a family, but they can immediately relate to, well, that happened in the Smith family or that happened in the Johnson family and, and they turned out okay. We didn't have anything like that. We didn't know anyone. So we didn't know that it was okay to feel angry or to feel hurt or to feel upset or to feel confused. I, I know those first few days of my emotions being all over the place, I was thinking, I'm making much too much out of this. I probably shouldn't be making so much out of this. And then I go, but it hurts. It really hurts. And I don't understand. And I need to understand. And it wasn't until the group was created and more and more people came in that I was feeling more validated that, yeah, I was, I had every right to feel the way I feel. Everyone else is feeling this right. too now. That's right. Yeah. That's a great point. And, and when I said a minute ago that we don't have a playbook, that's exactly what with the trauma recovery coaching, that's exactly what you're trying to create is some type of a playbook and, and additional resources. Right for people to, to seek out assistance in their own personal healing, because this is, this is a journey. You know, I had, uh, I, I had, a, a one of our people the other day reach out to, to me and, um, she said, when is this, when is this going to end? And she told me a story about, uh, her mother and, and kind of that whole thing and, and the family that involves her MP status. And, uh, I just, I just told her, I said, it, it's not, it's not going to end. I mean, this is your life. This is, the only thing you can do is develop better tools to handle these situations and to slowly change how you, right. how you perceive things and, and how you interact with what's going on. Um, and I think that's important for people to know. And that's what the trauma recovery coaching uh, is, is going to be designed to do to offer more support. Yes. So, okay, well, let's lighten up a little bit. 